Hi, Martha. It's so hey, good Sarah. to meet you. Likewise. It's so good to finally meet you. <laughs> it's amazing to see you out there spreading so many great messages, doing so much amazing work. One of my favorite things about your work is actually that you don't just dismantle, you don't just disrupt, but you actually go into these spaces and build new systems, not only for yourself, but to help out all of these orgs, like all the pro bono work you did for digital strategizing for orgs. And I never even thought that that would be something that would be needed. So I applaud you for doing all of that. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you. I think so much of how I started was existing in nonprofits, because when you think of nonprofit, a lot of times, especially now, you think of protests, but there is so much that goes behind, as you probably know, um, to the different work. And I think communications is definitely a space that's a luxury to so many, but it's not. So often I feel that like going to a protest gets equated to like organizing right. and it's not the same thing, right? Like organizing, it's what makes a difference in policy. It's what makes the difference in dismantling oppressive yeah. systems. So it's amazing. I don't know how you find time in the day. You wear so many hats. <laughs> like, yeah, I think I definitely was wearing so many hats during the time that I started. And I think as I've continued to grow, I've learned the importance of like, you know, understanding when it's okay and when it might not be for yourself. So I think, you know, at first when I was celebrated for the many hats, I would just say thank you. But now I just, more than caution, I celebrate those who know when to step in and step out. Um, I've found much love for art and for expression in uh, organizing and especially with the internet. So you being an illustrator is really awesome because I'm not really the best at that. I love to hear more about how did your love for illustration start? Putting my thoughts and feelings into words has never been my forte. Expressing myself through art has been like the main way I deal with my emotions and work through my mm -hmm. emotions. I didn't go to art school or business school. Um, so it's been a lot of learn as you go for me. I started my shop in my last year of college in 2016. Um, then the 2016 election happened and I posted one of my drawings online. Like the night the results came in, I just, I felt so not seen and not heard at that moment, you know? And uh, it was just a way for me to get all my frustrations out. And uh, I got such like powerful feedback and people seem to really connect with that piece that sort of inspired me to keep going and keep posting these drawings it makes me happy to know that that happened for you and that like you didn't stop after there because you didn't want to you know um, yeah how do you feel your costa rican heritage and your immigration background has inspired or influenced your art and your creative process i strongly feel that costa ricans there's going to be that cheesy pride that people get mad about. But we strive to find common middle ground. And though that might seem weak to some, to make changes, yeah. understanding you're not really going to convince everyone, no matter how mad you are, right? And that might be kind of salty to say in this time and age, but it's the truth. The culture of my country and my family's attitudes have impacted the way I go into spaces because I realized that aside from everybody's complex identities, you don't change the world by expecting to change it overnight, though you move like you will, right? Yes, and it's especially important how you were mentioning, like, obviously your story isn't like the end all be all of the immigrant experience, but it's so important that you're like, it sounds cheesy to say out loud, but undocumented and unafraid. You're always told to be afraid, right? Because you're putting yourself at risk, you're putting your family at risk if they're undocumented also. So it's amazing that some DACA recipients or some immigrants just period do have that that passion to keep to stay at the forefront of the struggle because that's the only way that change is going to happen, right? Absolutely. What do you think is the biggest issue facing the Hispanic community? It's it's so hard to speak of it as because obviously you know Latinx community is not monolith. There's so many issues affecting us all differently, whether it be migration status or race or income inequality. It's sort of just we're all under this oppressive system, um, and it's we're being targeted in different ways, um, and we're all being put under the same umbrella. <laughs> You answered it because the answer is that there is no answer for a, a massive amount of people. We can't answer that. 
you know, individually. It's being answered collectively by building these spaces where we get to exist and not voice everyone, right? How does your Hispanic heritage inspire and inform your art as a digital illustrator? So it's just my art is an extension of myself and my experiences. Um, and I just make things that speak to me and speak to people like me who can relate to to wanting to be seen, I guess. <laughs> what does your brand's name, Gilded Nopal, symbolize and represent? The name of my shop is actually really significant to me. Gil is my last name, so Gilded is a play on that. It means to be covered in gold. And a nopal is a Mexican Spanish for a prickly pear cactus. I believe that's what they're called. It's always been a really important symbol of strength and resilience for me, and I really wanted to incorporate that into my name. Why did you start the business? I started this shop just sort of as a creative outlet, but it's really grown into something more. Like one of my favorite things to see for my customers is when teachers send me pictures of my posters on their walls. And it really blows my mind that they would want my art in such important places where all these young minds are being molded, you know? That must feel insane. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does for sure. Can you tell me how what inspired you to start writing poetry and why you want to share it with the world? Got the opportunity one day in class, my English teacher, shout out to Ms. Gill, to be introduced to creative writing <laughs> in such a way that made me realize that writing was limitless, just like painting, just like every other art form. And the more I learned about haikus and like these creative ways that you could basically speak on paper, I was like, well, why not? In 2017, when Trump presented DACA, I did not transfer to community college, very much so assuming that it was just going to be the end, right, of DACA and so much more hope for immigration reform. And I got to begin to speak alongside the candidate for governor at the time, Governor Murphy, who's now the governor of New Jersey. And through speaking, I gained some form of courage. Our forms of expression are what then encourage others that can relate to us in some way, shape, or form to speak out as well when needed. And I think my poetry, it's one of the many tools that I've been using since I have just been young to express myself and to hopefully, you know, in some way inspire somebody else. Yeah, that's amazing. And like you said, representation is so important, especially in art spaces where it can be very monolithic, I think. Obviously, there are POC artists, but they don't get the spotlight that they deserve very mm. often. Spoken word art and poetry is also so important because it connects with so many people on a level that other art just can't, I think. Yeah, so, I think there's also so much pressure on spoken word to sound a certain way. I know my personality is very positive, very like, hi, right? But I think my poems were like a complete switch. And it was like, okay, this is awkward. They were like, is this your poetry? And it's like, <laughs> poetry. You've interviewed presidents. You've interviewed governors and change makers. You're a change maker yourself. And you've begun Population Mike. So what's next for you? What's next on your bucket list? <laughs> on my bucket list. I think I'm definitely excited uh, for Population Mike. Because though it's a really small initiative right now, my passion for building, uh, you know, relationships and conversation around ways to create sustainable solutions at a local level continues. When I thought of Population Mike, the goal was to make everyone aware of their own story, right? A lot of times we're giving out so much and we're not aware of ourselves. And not that I'm the queen of awareness, but... It's definitely been helpful to understand our individual stories through the work I've done and with the people I've worked with. So I think that's what's yeah. going to continue to be next, hopefully. Why is it so important in today's society to express yourself and champion your creativity? Um, uh, well, part of the reason why I think it's so important is because it's so easy to spread positive messages to people who need them. So by making a piece... For example, my queer conchas and have somebody say, hey, that really resonates with me. I'm Mexican. Yeah. I'm queer. Yeah. And uh, I that, that really speaks to me. And this person lives in like Florida or 
Illinois or someplace that, you know, I likely would have never met them, but we were able to make this connection over this common thing is amazing. What guidance or advice do you have for up and coming artists and activists like yourself? I think that is very much mentionable to say that I asked a lot of questions to a lot of people when I started. Don't be afraid, though you will, to ask questions that feel silly because when you are starting, what is silly to you is simply not that silly, right? If you don't know the answer to a question, then there is somebody who does. And I love that. Yeah. What is your advice to the next generation? I think my advice would be to embrace Embrace your identity and who you are and all the intersectionalities that make you you. But don't be afraid to challenge tradition. Like tradition is very much put on a pedestal. Sometimes you have to take a look at parts of it and think like, "Mm, that's messed up or I don't really like that. I don't think that's very inclusive. Maybe we can change that. Culture isn't stagnant, right? It's always changing. And uh, it can change for the better if we, we make those changes. That is true. I love to hear it. Everybody needs to hear that one more time. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for spending time with me. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for making time because I know you're like one of the busiest people. (laughs) So I really appreciate this. We definitely have to talk again soon. And I'm just so happy that we got to talk today. (laughs) For sure.